For the last several months, Zcam has been the camera you've requested the most for me to cover on this channel. And today, we're finally going to do it. Let's get undone. What's happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and I hope DaVinci resolves my personal issues. So Zcam has quite a few cameras now, but this one is from their flagship line and is the E2 F6. The F6 meaning it's their full frame 6K sensor. They also have an F8, which is a full frame 8K, an M4, which is a 4K micro four thirds, and an S6, which is a super 35 6K. And they also have the original E2 and E2C, which use the older body style, but may offer some pricing advantages depending on your needs. And I'm saying Z instead of Z, because that's what the company prefers to be called. I think the F6 might be the sweet spot though if you're looking for the best Zcam has to offer. I borrowed this one from Viztech, which is Canada's exclusive reseller for Zcam, so thanks to Viztech for the hookup. And check them out if you're Canadian and looking to get into Zcam. Viztech also carries all the important accessories as well. And while we're on the topic of thanking people, I wanna thank Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. More on that later though. But speaking of accessories, this is one camera that thrives under heavy rigging, but that's also somehow not too limited without it. If you wanted to run this camera without any accessories at all, you could. It has a built-in Sony L-Series battery sled, which gets me close to three hours of runtime on max settings with an NPF 970 battery. It has a full set of function buttons, menu control, a breakout connector to XLR audio inputs, and even a tiny LCD screen to frame up the shot. Now, I wouldn't really recommend using this camera without a monitor, as it does much better with one. You can't be expected to compose well on a one-inch sensor in the field. But for a purpose like live streaming, it's good to know that you don't really need any accessories at all. The build quality is great for the most part. It feels rugged, I like the modular design, and the buttons are well-placed and pleasing to press. However, that L-Series battery sled that I just praised the convenience of could use a little polishing up. I found it more difficult than necessary to slot the battery in, and I can only get it in on an angle and only on the third or fourth try. However, one of the highlights of its construction is the interchangeable lens mount. By simply removing four screws on the front, you can swap the mount out to EF, M mount, micro four thirds, and PL, and you can expand these mounts further with the new electronic ND that slides into the side of that mount to add neutral density to the camera, which is fantastic. But you should be aware that this can make it exceptionally difficult to clean your image if you find you're getting spots in your shots when stopped down. Rather than just using a swab on your sensor like with other cameras, you have to take the mount off and clean both sides of the stack in the mount because there's glass in the adapter, and also clean the front of the filter stack on the top of the sensor as well. And if you're really unlucky like me and somehow have schmutz stuck in between elements or beneath the filter stack, you're in for quite a treat. Now I blame this on the fact that this is a loner as I tend to prevent things like that from ever happening, but with this camera I noticed a spec in the top corner of my shots and was unable to get it out despite cleaning every side of every element I had access to. I didn't take the filter stack off the sensor because again, this isn't mine, but it was very annoying and affected my images negatively, and it's just something you should consider when using interchangeable mounts that contain glass. The other drawback to this customizable design is that it can get a little out of balance toward the front end. As you can see here, it kind of tilts forward, but that can be offset by using a larger L-series battery in the rear, which is advised anyway if you want longer runtime. And if you want to step that up even further, you can use an L-series to V-mount adapter, but be careful which one you choose. I have two here. I have the FX line one and this tilt -a one And the FX line one, because it's wider, actually blocks the ports in the back and isn't really ideal, where the tilt -a one is much more thoughtful in its design and better suited to this camera. Now, speaking of those ports on the back, they're excellent, but they aren't without their limitations. To the positive, they've got almost everything you'd need. Full-size HDMI, two-pin power in and out, so you can run this camera from mains power, but also relay that power to an accessory like a monitor. It has USB-C, which can be used for file sharing, streaming, and recording your files to an external SSD. It has a Wi-Fi antenna for similar sharing and streaming capabilities, two control ports, a remote jack, and that XLR breakout port I mentioned earlier. But that XLR port is one of the cons as well. I typically don't like these little XLR connectors as you're putting a lot of stress on a small point of failure. I would much prefer to see a full size XLR jack on a cine camera, but I realize space is limited on this little guy. There is a 3.5 millimeter microphone in and headphone jack on the side, and the camera does have a built-in microphone if you're just recording a scratch track. But the audio options in the menu are quite limited and the preamps aren't the greatest. So I'd highly recommend recording to an external audio recorder for all those reasons. Here, have a listen to my regular mic here, the Octava MK12, but run through the Zcam and through the Blackmagic for comparison while I tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks.
Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you could really use some footage, but shooting it yourself was either budgetarily or logistically unfeasible? Well, Storyblocks has you covered with an impressive collection of stock footage covering a wide range of subjects with unlimited downloads and 4K video. They're also amply supplied with backgrounds, overlays, and After Effects templates, and the interface is easy to use and navigate, and the clips are royalty-free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. So if you think you could take advantage of a fantastic library of quality stock footage and effects, check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. But if you need even more reason to use an external audio recorder, I noticed serious audio syncing issues when switching settings and record modes on this camera. You might have even noticed it in the sample I just showed you. If you record to an external SSD, the audio was only in sync for me at 60 frames per second, and got worse as my frame rate decreased, finding its way down to a 2 frame delay at 23.98. And that was just using the built-in microphone. You can improve this by changing your codec, but I didn't feel comfortable with the inconsistency here and that additional post work that it created. So again, save yourself the headache and just use an external audio device. Getting back to the ports though, there's also the Gigabit Ethernet RJ45 connector that we'll discuss again when we talk about live streaming, but it provides excellent functionality and completes the I.O. for this camera. The only other con with this port configuration is that as you can clearly see, everything is exposed, so this camera clearly isn't going to do well in bad weather compared to something like the S1H, which is probably its closest competitor at the same price with the same sensor, but the S1H is fantastically weather sealed. For recording you have a couple options. You can use the USB-C to SSD that we already mentioned, you can use the single internal CFAST slot, or you can record externally over HDMI. However, all three of these have limitations, and this brings me to my single biggest issue with this camera. It has acquisition problems. We'll talk about image quality in a minute, but what I think is more important than how the image looks is if you can successfully record it or not, and this camera has serious problems there. The most reliable method is by using CFAST, which sucks because CFAST presents a terrible value proposition compared to SSDs. It's already been replaced with a better interface in CF Express, and the prices have never been correctly adjusted to reflect those inefficiencies. That being said, if you feel like spending an absurd $2 per gigabyte on storage, CFAST is the most reliable option unless you lose power. This camera does not write files in a way that can endure a power loss. On every other camera I own, if I record for 60 minutes but my battery dies at 55 minutes, I still have 55 minutes of usable footage. On this camera, you end up with zero minutes. This is completely unacceptable in my opinion. To work around this, the company has a safety measure for this in the form of file splitting. Basically, you choose an interval between 1 and 30 minutes, sometimes up to 60 minutes if you're using a smaller codec. And at that interval, the camera will write the file and start a new one. This way, if you lose power, you'll still have all the files up until that last split. But that means in order for this to be effective, you need to set the split duration to be quite short. Setting it to 30 minutes or 60 minutes still means you could lose 30 or 60 minutes worth of potentially unrepeatable footage. But setting the duration to a safer, smaller interval is terrible for long-form content. You end up with dozens of files that need to be joined using Zcam software. You can't just join them together in your NLE because due to the way the files are written, a small audio gap is created between the splits. Zcam has a program called their concatenator, which joins the files for you and fixes the audio gap, but it adds a lengthy extra step onto your post-production. I appreciate that Zcam has provided solutions for the problems along the way, but rather than adding file splitting to address file corruption, and then software to fix audio gaps in the split files, why not just fix the issue of not saving files during a power loss? Now, due to the design of the camera, you can provide your own redundant power configuration. You can use both the L-series battery and the two-pin power port at the same time to give you a power backup that seamlessly switches over. It's thoughtful and well-implemented. But even if you set your camera up this way, you still can't turn off the file splitting as it's forced on and thus you're forced to use the concatenator. All of these problems exist when using the USB-C port to external SSD as well, so although that's a better option when it comes to price per gigabyte, it's not immune to these issues. So this leaves recording over HDMI. But unfortunately, that's not free of issues either. First of all, you're limited to 4K60, which honestly is no big deal, but it makes you wonder why you paid for a 6K camera. Heck, in my comparison between the S1H and S1, I suggested that for most people, the S1 with an Atomos Ninja might be a better option than the S1H and cheaper. But for the Zcam, we're now talking a similar price of an S1H plus a Ninja just to record long-form content. Now, the Ninja still isn't great when it loses power. It also corrupts the file, but the file is easily recoverable. You can use VLC on your computer if you want, which is free, or the Atomos has a built-in tool that lets you recover the file right in the playback screen, and it's always been successful for me. I tried using similar recovery methods with the internally recorded Zcam files that got corrupted, and nothing that was free worked. I didn't try any paint solutions, but from what I can tell, the files recorded with an internal power loss are not recoverable like the Atomos files are. 
but at least the Ninja method lets you bypass any file splitting and you can record one long seamless interview if you wanted. Unless you want to record that interview in 23.98 frames per second. Because for some reason, there's an issue with the HDMI handshaking between the Zcam and the Atomos, where only 24p flat film frame rate works over HDMI, and 23.98 flips back to 59.94. All the other frame rates work correctly, 25, 30, 50, 60. It's just 23.98 which doesn't work, which is a huge issue for me as I record on that frame rate the majority of the time. Now I've brought this issue up with the CEO, and he acknowledged that there will need to be a firmware update to fix this, but that's as much as I know. So as it stands right now, I have no way to film long form content in an efficient way with this camera at 23.98 frames per second, which is basically a non-starter for me, and thus I can't recommend this camera to someone with similar needs as me. But there's issues with other frame rates over HDMI as well. I've noticed the same frame rate mismatch can also happen if you choose ProRes 422HQ as your internal codec. For some reason, even if you don't have any cards or SSDs attached to the camera, choosing 422HQ disabled 4K over HDMI and you're left with a very soft 1080p image at an incorrect frame rate. Look at this shot here. The camera was set to 4K 30, but because I was in ProRes 422HQ, the camera dropped the 1080p 60 and produced a blurrier image. It was fine if I set the camera to ProRes 422, but for some reason switching to HQ changed the HDMI frame rate signal and reduced the sharpness and bit depth. But internal 1080p recordings look a lot sharper than this. This reduction in quality can also be activated when using the assist tools, but I'll talk more about them in a minute. Our potential saving grace I've noticed though is that if you activate RAW over HDMI, the frame rate issue is fixed. Now it just displays static because currently my Ninja can't handle the RAW signal, but this leads me to believe that the upcoming ProRes RAW update for the Atomos for this camera will likely fix most of these external recording issues. It will introduce new ones though, which is that I can't edit ProRes RAW in DaVinci Resolve and I'm not about to switch back to Premiere just for that reason. So for Premiere or Final Cut users, that update could potentially solve it for you. But for Resolve users, long form 23.98 will still be dead unless Zcam releases a fix. However, if you instead shoot at PAL frame rates or lean mostly towards short clips that rely on slow motion a lot, this camera has you covered. It has terrific frame rate and resolution combinations, allowing you to hit good quality high speed recordings with very few caveats. The only thing I can think of is that the 4K60 crops in from your full frame viewing angle, just like on the S1H. But if you're worried about your shot to shot consistency, Zcam does allow you to enable the crop for the other frame rates too, so you don't have to worry about changing lenses when you switch to 60p. In fact, they even have a low jello mode once you activate that crop to help reduce the rolling shutter, which is noticeable on this sensor just like we saw with the S1H, which is another reason why I prefer the S1. But if you're interested in learning more about that or seeing more of a comparison between the S1H and the Zcam E2 F6, I highly recommend you watch Flannel Ninja's video. I usually prefer to share quality test videos that are out there already rather than just recreate them and steal views. And Flannel Ninjas is great, so go check that video out, link in the description. I can say that I agree with most of his findings. The Zcam E2 F6 creates a great image that is very flexible thanks to the 10-bit output and quality of Zlog 2, but it is a little different than the S1H or something like the Blackmagic. Color is very subjective and usually not worth discussing, since if you have a quality 10-bit recording, you can usually get the colors to look however you want. But if we talk about uncorrected colors or just using the provided LUTs, I can say that landscapes look gorgeous on the Zcam, but skin tones and reds in general aren't quite as dialed in. I find for fair skin people like me, the camera overdoes it on the magenta and you'll need to correct quite a few points on the tint to fix that. I find I can get a zero tint on the S1H where I need a minus three or minus four on the Zcam. And I find my Pocket 4K produces a more even skin tone overall than the Zcam. However, it's possible that people with a more olive complexion might favor the Zcam here. But again, just change it in post to look however you want. The recordings are robust enough to do that. Although if you're someone who's used some easier logs in the past, like Canon's, you might find Zlog 2 a bit more challenging to get it to look exactly how you want. But that's completely subjective. So all I can tell you is that I had a harder time with Z Zlog 2 than I did with Blackmagic Film or C-Log 2 or even S-Log 2. Zlog 2 does expose a little differently and is much flatter than some competing log profiles. I found that when the curve was normalized, we're left with an image that doesn't quite succeed as well on the highlights as the Blackmagic. It's close, but it does do a very good job of managing noise. Because of the impressive squeeze on this log, you can shoot up to 50 to 60,000 ISO and pull the image back down to impressive results. And darker image areas handle noise better than I expected. And the camera's noise reduction is subtle but effective and gives you the option to completely turn it off, which is always appreciated. 
While no camera does particularly well when underexposed, what I like about the Z-Cam is that you're not forced to overexpose just to keep it clean. However, I did find that exposing half a stop over the recommended 40% zone produces a nicer image that looks better when applying the Z-Cam 709 LUT as well. In fact, even when using the built-in metering, I found it tended to expose middle gray closer to 50%, which came in a bit hot after applying the LUT. So I find that 46 to 47% middle gray is the sweet spot. So for quick tip in a controlled environment, you get the camera's meter to give you an exposure and then dial it back about a third of a stop to get pretty great results. Although putting the LUT on your monitor and exposing that way is probably the easiest way. But an issue I noticed regarding both exposure and that tint thing I mentioned a moment ago is that this camera suffers from pretty pronounced hue shifts when changing ISOs. It happens in stages, but let's say that you white balanced correctly for ISO 400, you'll find that up to 1000 holds that balance pretty well. But once you switch to ISO 1250, there's a noticeable shift to green, which also holds until you hit ISO 2500, which then shifts back to magenta and putting it more neutral again. And then that holds until about ISO 5000 when it starts to really shift with ISO 8000 being a pronounced green cast and worsening from there. And getting back to those assist tools now, the camera has a solid collection of them, like peaking, zebras, false color, waveforms, vector scope, and more, and they work reasonably well and are nice inclusions. But there's a couple of issues I've noticed with some of those tools. First, they reduce the sharpness and bit depth of the image coming over HDMI when they're on, just like I showed you with that landscape 1080p shot. This is likely a limitation of the signal compositing when adding these elements to the feed, but it is noticeable when viewed on a larger display. Everything gets softer when you turn on zebras or peaking and there's far worse banding. Likely you won't be recording this, but if you're someone who tends to record screen captures for some reason, be aware of this quality reduction. The clean feed looks as good as it should, however, and for most people that's all that matters, except for that ProRes 422HQ bug that I mentioned earlier. However, using the built-in LUT function can also have this negative effect. So if you're recording externally, apply the LUTs on your recorder, do not apply them in camera, because I found the image quality to be much worse when applying them in camera. More banding and reduced sharpness. The built-in LUTs are inconsistent anyway. The Rec. 709 LUT in the camera is quite a bit different than the one Zcam provides to apply in post, and they both look different from actually shooting in the Rec. 709 profile instead of log. But speaking of that Rec. 709 profile, it is fantastic. It's one of the nicest straight out of camera 709 profiles I've ever seen. Huge credit to them for that one. Now, we didn't talk much about the codec options, but they're also pretty great. You've got H.264, H.265, ProRes, and internal Z-RAW. And they're all at at least 10-bit except for the H.264, which is only 8-bit 420. The chroma subsampling is something you could complain about on the H.265 as well. While it is 10-bit, it's only 420, which is suboptimal. But it's hard to complain when there's an internal ProRes option, ranging from proxy through LT, 422, and 422HQ. HQ, however, is only available in certain resolutions and frame rate combinations, and again, causes that HDMI mismatch issue. You should also be aware that it bakes proxy files into your ProRes recordings, and these can't be turned off. They're needed because without them, the camera can't play back the files to review your clips. But it might throw you off the first time you review recordings on your computer, because you might think your 6K files are only 720p. You're likely just seeing the proxy track, and once you bring it into your NLE, you'll get the full 6K. However, if you want to separate that proxy track into a different file, you'll need to use another Zcam program to do that. The RAW is good too, but because it isn't supported in Resolve, I'm forced to use Zcam's separate RAW developer, which is feature rich, but slow to export, and again inflates my post-production time. To its credit though, it has all the features you'd want to see in a RAW developer. White balance adjustments, ISO changes, output profile selection, and so on. I just wish it was built into Resolve. The other thing we haven't talked about much is the 6K aspect of this camera, and that's because I haven't actually seen much of a difference between the 6K and the super sampled 4K. I tested multiple lenses to make sure it wasn't a lens limitation, including high-end cine primes, and I found the differences between super sampled 4K and 6K were only perceivable when zoomed in like 8 to 900%, and it doesn't matter if you shoot ProRes or RAW. Now my first instinct was why should anyone buy a 6K camera then? But I think instead it might speak to the quality of the super sampled 4K, because I found the image to be as detailed, if not better, than the A7 III super sampled 4K, which I've always thought was very sharp and detailed. So I think we have a situation like we have with Canon C500 Mark II, where the 6K is there, and so is RAW, but in most cases you're probably better off using the 4K 10-bit intraframe option, which will give you pretty much the same quality, but with a much more efficient workflow with smaller files, while still taking advantage of all the benefits of that full-frame sensor. 
Now, if you've been keeping track of my pros and cons, you may have noticed a common thread. This is a camera that has a great 709 profile. It does better than expected in low light, handles noise well, and has a built-in Ethernet port, doesn't require accessories to function, and is small and modular. To me, that sounds like the ultimate live streaming camera. The only category I didn't mention is autofocus, but it actually has that too. Now, it's quite terrible and you can't use it to track a moving subject, but I did multiple live streams with this camera already and found that you can work the autofocus in two useful ways. If you're in a static position and just talking, the continuous human tracking does work well enough for a casual stream. I ran it for three and a half hours, and my only issue is that it takes a long time to acquire focus, so if you leave the stream and come back. But it held it reasonably well if I didn't move too much, it didn't really hunt in the background. You can also control the camera over Ethernet using a web browser, and in there you could set it to autofocus continuous, wait till it acquires you, and then turn the autofocus off completely, remotely, and it'll stay locked on. It's like having an Ethernet focus puller. So while not as convenient as having flawless face tracking, it's very helpful for a solo shooter trying to live stream with the camera out of arm's reach. Now, since all of the cameras I mentioned in the beginning of the video have this port and these streaming benefits, I probably wouldn't buy the F6 strictly for that purpose, as it is a $4,000 camera, but the E2C at $800 or even the M4 at $1,500 would do that job nicely. Of course, you'd have to assume worse low light performance with the smaller sensors, and you'd be forced to use wider lenses, which would give you more depth of field if you need separation in your shot but those Ethernet benefits would still be there for considerably less money. During my tests, I tried streaming over HDMI and Ethernet and compared them, and found that when streaming in log, the HDMI through the Atomos and then applying a LUT there does produce a nicer image, but it introduces its own HDMI handshaking issues to go out from the Ninja 5 and then into your capture card. But when streaming in Rec. 709, the quality advantage was gone and Ethernet just became the cheaper, simpler option, as you can just use the SSP plugin for OBS and connect to your camera through its IP address, and you're good to go. Then you can clean up or grade the image in OBS for free versus buying an Atomos and adding LUTs that way. And the latency was pretty great for what it is. I also used that live stream as an opportunity to stress test the camera. At one point, I had it recording to an SSD, streaming over HDMI and Ethernet at the same time, and controlling the camera remotely for over an hour, all concurrently, and it didn't crash, overheat, or drop a single frame in the recording. It did get warm to the touch, but it didn't fail, which was quite impressive. All right, let's wrap up. As I said, I'm currently borrowing this camera, and usually when my review period is up, I have to decide if I'm gonna buy the camera or not. This is an important put my money where my mouth is moment. And in this case, no, I will not be buying this camera, but I will be keeping an eye on it. As it currently stands for $4,000, I'd rather have the S1H. I think it has a slightly better image, at least for what I shoot. It's weather sealed, easier to hold, has amazing stabilization, better audio controls, and fewer quirks. But to be honest, I'm not buying the S1H either, because I prefer the S1 and Ninja 5 combo, as I said in a previous video. The Z-Cam definitely pulls ahead in some areas, and I appreciate its novel ideas and modularity. It has great functionality for live streaming, and it impressed me with its look straight out of camera. But I just can't get my head around the file splitting and power loss issue, or the reliance on three separate pieces of software depending on whether you need to concatenate your files, develop your raw video, or isolate your proxies. My post-production just takes longer when using this camera, and that can only be justified by either vastly superior image quality or significantly lower upfront costs but this camera provides neither of those. At best, it's equal to the S1H in most cases, but it costs more since it relies heavily on the Atomos Ninja 5. And my Blackmagic Pocket cameras are so much easier to use when it comes to post-production that I keep going back to them. But to Zcam's credit, they're known for being receptive to feedback and for producing quality firmware updates on a regular basis, which is admirable. So perhaps some issues will be addressed in future updates. But in the meantime, Zcam is definitely an important player in the market and one I'll be keeping a close eye on. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining, or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure to leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. Yeah, all right. I'm done.